Okay, let's get started on this back to school transition workshop. Um, if you're on the call or you're joining in the call, just use the chat to um, introduce yourself, tell us who your kids are, um, if you want to, where you're from maybe, and um, that's where you can put questions or <laughs> triggers that you're having during this back to school time. I'm just gonna start with a little intro about myself, um, go into like what a trigger is and, um, and maybe how your values and your healthy, you know, how your values and your boundaries might be affecting um, some of those triggers that you're having. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Shayla. Um, I've got a surprise guest. Yay! <laughs> and then I'll end with some tools and strategies that might be um, useful if you're looking for like something tangible to support you during this time. So I just want to introduce myself first. I will send the recording out to anyone that's signed up to get it. I'm Tanya, um, Tanya Milano Snell. I was an environmental educator, early educator for over 15 years. And um, I, so I had back to school transitions for most of my life. I've dealt with back to school transitions and I've struggled with that change my entire life. It's been, um, change has been hard for me. And back to school has happened several times. And as a teacher, not just in the beginning of the school year, but after each break and even after each weekend. So you may be noticing that with your children too. Um, so ultimately what I realized is that I was trying to control over the years, control what was going to happen on each of those transitions, whether it be uh, Monday morning or Sunday night or the first day of school, the first week of school or, you know, before school even started, like trying to make the situation okay for myself so I would feel good. And that meant I had to kind of control the external of like the things that might go wrong, like envisioning all the things. So um, as a teacher, I would set myself up for the first week of school, like knowing that these are some of the things that are gonna, the kids are gonna need. These are some of the things that I will need. It will sometimes take weeks to get into a groove together. Um, and so at home, it's, it's not really that different, um, except for my kids showed me. So as when I became a mom, um, my kids showed me pieces and parts of myself that I didn't realize I had because I was controlling the environment so much like trying to make it the way I wanted it to be so they brought pieces and parts of me that I had repressed some of them since childhood um and at school I could plan adequate curriculum around it or like it's a group so I could kind of nurture the group and we had to do things in a certain way because we're part of a system and at home it was like humanity took over. <laughs> like, I just had to like figure it out as I went, like that I was more of a f in the flow type of person than I realized I was because my kids showed me how much they had. I was starting to adapt or to um, embrace, I guess, more of that I can be in the moment when it arises and yet I was still having these triggers and what it is what a trigger does is flashes you back to a previous moment of your life and you sometimes get these body sensations that you're ignoring and a feeling and then your behavior comes out the feeling drives the behavior so I asked a bunch of people what their triggers were in this back to school time. I know some of mine and I pulled everybody, I listed some and it wasn't until um, I met Leslie 
or I saw her speak about the safe seat process that I realized I didn't quite have a grasp on how to be in the moment with my children, how to be in that human process of emotional regulation as, as these changes came up, whether it be getting ready for school, going to bed, uh, when they're sick. <laughs> these are some of the things people listed. Um, when there is a mess, like I'm trying to get out the door and there's a mess, like someone said, everything's messy. <laughs> I just wanna get to the car. Um, so these are some of the things people listed. The safe seat practice is something that totally changed how to be more present in those moments rather than controlling, planning, and all of that that I was doing in the past that worked in the classroom setting um, and did not work so much in the home setting. Mm -hmm. um, so before I go into my the trigger, I was going to share the trigger of sleep because that's a huge one for me. I just wanted to see if Leslie, you could introduce yourself <laughs> and give your version of this back to school transition and how safe to you. <laughs> I would be so happy to. Thank you, Tanya. I'm so excited to be with here with you. It's just such a joy. I'm just like grinning inside. <laughs> See you in your pure joy shirt. I know. And your kids coming in. Hi, honey. <laughs> Soccer. Soccer practice. So I am so happy to have Leslie here because. You were instrumental in going from that, you know, that and ex, you know, trying to control the external to my internal experience. Yes. And well, you, you just described it so beautifully. You know, our focus gets. Hi, Shayla. Our focus. Hello. <laughs> our focus gets our attention. Hi, sweetie. Our attention gets so focused on the external because we were trained that way as children. We were trained to monitor how our parents were feeling or what they were thinking or were we going to get in trouble or, you know, so we're always, we were trained outside. So we're, we're, we read the external. And as you say, if the external starts to move because you're shifting from one place to the other, you start to get more and more hypervigilant, right? Because you're trying to manage the external. And as Tanya said, if, if we are willing to bring our attention and focus back internal what we'll find is uh, the image i've been using lately i'll just use this one because it's such a great one so, so we've been studying projection in our pure joy training right now and projection you want to imagine when you go to the movie theater and you're watching a movie right because it's coming out of the projector you look up and there's a projector and it's coming out and it's coming on the screen and you don't like what's happening up there right? You just do not like it. Can you imagine going up to the screen and trying to change the movie, right? So you march up to the screen and you're like, I don't like this. I'm going to move this around. I'm going to do this, right? It's not going to happen because it's a projection of what's happening inside. So that's why we go inside because whatever we're seeing out here that we're trying, our children become the screen, or the world becomes a screen and we're trying to manipulate the screen, but it doesn't change from there. So as you said, Tanya, I could, I could manipulate certain things, but it never changed because the internal still had an experience from the past and a story about you and feelings about transitions. So the safe seat process, which Tanya is going to teach you, I'm sure, after I leave, because I've got another session in 15 minutes. But the safe seat process became, for me, a way to take my attention off the external and go internal. But then I thought, ah, what do I do? Because it was crazy in here. <laughs> you know, I was like, you said, I had all these sensations. I had all these feelings. I had all these stories. And it's like, this is a madhouse in here. <laughs> so what do I do with this? And that's when I created the safe C process and she will guide you through to actually be able to turn back in and watch the internal movie mm -hmm. and see that the internal movie was actually not true. It was based in a memory from before 
all my fear. I have a, um, I'll give you an example. I have a really hard time with airports because I missed the most incredible flight of my life. A friend forgot to pick me up. He overslept. <laughs> and it was the most important flight of my life. I was going to New York City to go for acting school. And so it was so painful. I stood at the window crying as the airplane took off. And so I get very, very, very anxious anytime I fly. And I do like you, I pack ahead of time and I get everything ready. And it doesn't, it doesn't resolve anything because that anxiety, that internal experience is what's driving the movie out here. Mm -hmm. So I really learned every time it's still not easy, but I have to go in and really meet that one that's still terrified, that's scared she's going to miss. And I have to go, oh, honey, I know, I know you're so afraid you're going to miss that plane. And then I go, and the reality is if you do, there's another one, you know, I just, I just like literally walk myself through my internal movie. So finally, I'm actually projecting out my adult capacities and my adult capacities go, yeah, you might miss the plane, but if you do, this can happen and you may be late, but if you do, this can happen. But from that panicked anxiety place inside, I'm projecting out everything that's going to go wrong so I can control it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right what you were describing Tanya yeah and the yeah. biggest the biggest um indicator that I'm trying to control the external or change my kids or whatever is when I say should or need so <laughs> like you should be at the bus right now <laughs> or you need to be asleep by 8 p.m you know, when I use those two words, that means I'm really trying to project my values or my wants onto your, mo your movie. <laughs> in your movie, they're going to bed. Right? And in your movie, they're going to the bus. So you're projecting onto them and the movie's not doing that. And you're like, I put the screen saying, come on, screen change. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that analogy. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank yeah. you so much for being here too. Oh, sure. So, I was so excited that you said pop in. I'm like, sure. Yay. <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'll plug the training. If anybody's interested in the next training, it's coming up. So I will put the link to that as well, because yes. that's how I became a coach. Um, Leslie's program is life altering. <laughs> It really is. It's a personal as well as a professional training. I tell people because I make sure my coaches go through. Tanya's been through <laughs> all of this. I, I like internal. You get to really work your internal movie. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. I'm gonna. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a really big trigger of mine <laughs> for back to school that I've worked through over and over and then open it up to um, other people that want to share on the call. And if so we have gonna, time- I'm gonna scoot out just cause I got a 5.30, but I just yeah. wanted to come in. Tell Thank you, you I love so you. much. Work with, work with Tanya, she's amazing. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. So, um, sleep. Sleep is a big trigger. And I know Shayla, you shared this one. So I'm going to tell you my, my journey of sleep <laughs> and we'll see what comes up. But I value sleep. That is a huge high value of mine that if I don't sleep well, I know that I'm not going to function well the next day. I will not be very nice to be around. Um, I'm less adaptable. I'm more reactive. I know that I need a lot of sleep. So I project that value onto my kids and I want them to value it too, so very much, except for I have, they have to kind of develop their own value in sleep. So when um, I, learned, I learned that this was different for other people when I got married and I was like, wow, not everybody values sleep as much as I do. My husband would want to watch TV in bed. And I'm like, I can't do that. Like, it doesn't help me sleep. Like, these are not the things that help me sleep. So knowing what helped me and what I needed that were just mine and not my children's or my husband, my partner, was really the first step. Like, these are the things I need for my bedtime routine and that helped me to be restful and be able to sleep. 
um, so the, the, there's a, there is a tool in my program on how to set up a bedtime routine with your child, like going through like family meeting, like, what do you like before bed? What works and what doesn't work? That kind of thing um, can be really helpful. And just using that word, I noticed, I noticed when you did this before bed, you were up till 10 p.m. I noticed when you did that before bed, you went to sleep a bit earlier. Or um, I noticed that when you were up till 10 p.m., it was really hard for you to get to school the next morning. I noticed when you went to bed a bit earlier, we got up and we and you were able to get ready um, easier. So just using that word I notice can really help for the child to start to understand what it is they need rather than what we need. Um, and the other thing is with sleep, you do need to set healthy boundaries around sleep because it's important to you as the parent to have sleep. So um, I'll just give you my a little bit of my journey. When my kids were young, I valued their safety, their comfort, um, being there so they felt like somebody was with them and that they could go to sleep in a calm manner. So I did lay with them when they were younger. I still lay with my son. Um, he needs some massaging, some back scratching. Um, and they told me that they, like they gave me um, signs that they needed me there. When I would try to leave, there was a lot of stress not only for them, but for me, it did not feel good to me. And so I would lay with them and sleep went a lot easier. Now that my daughter's getting older, we've had a transition to what works for her and what works for me. I'm not going to lay in there while you listen to your audiobook or you read a book um, or whatever it is she needs. I have other things to do. So setting that healthy boundary. I want to be in bed by 10. That means you need to start earlier so I can have my time. And you're in your bedroom. It's my time to do this. So she now gets her own snack. If she needs a snack, she um, will, you know, have to turn her audiobook back on. If it's done, the 15 minutes, we kind of set a timer. If she's still not sleepy, she chooses to do it a little bit more. So kind of setting my boundary. So I'm not having to do these things for her. I'll go get the snack. <laughs> oh, we'll just read one more book. My boundary is that snack time is done. Lights are off now. You listen to your audiobooks. This is kind of the agreements that we have built over time. If you need more than that, I'm going to be in my bedroom. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, help you with that. I'm not going to be there to support that. You have to do that yourself. Um, so that's my boundary there. So that's kind of what's working for me in our family. And now, of course, some of this stems from a, a trigger. So I'm going to open it up to see. Um, what we can work through with Shayla. It looks like you, if you want to get in the hot seat, I can help you with yours. Um, I picked yours since it was in the event um, to read aloud to kind of give you my journey. 